Como analistas de datos, es de gran importancia que al preparar información para terceros tengamos presente el perfil e intereses de la audiencia a quien llegará la información. Para ejemplificar esto, en esta charla Darian Ignatius y David Ballet nos explicarán cómo varían la presentación de datos dependiendo de si estos están dirigidos hacia un jugador, un coach o un ejecutivo de un equipo deportivo. Um, so Pedro kind of already went over the introductions and stuff. Uh, I currently work as a data analyst at LAFC. Uh, I've been there since last summer. So right around the time that we brought in Gareth Bale and Giorgio Chiellini. Um, and like I said, I worked for the Navy for the past few years before that. And I did some youth soccer coaching, um, which actually is something that helped me land this role. Um, the integration of coaching and analytics uh, really ties in with you know, the presentation that we have today, communicating with our stakeholders. So I'm kind of go, gonna go over an overview of how I integrate with the stakeholders and how the work that I do gets communicated with them. Um, it'll be a little bit more higher level. And I think Dave will go a little bit more technical into kind of like a scouting, scouting use case. Um, so who are the stakeholders at our club? Um, our coaching staff, obviously. So they are involved a ton with our like pregame analysis and postgame analysis of our own team. Um, and they do have a ton of input in our scouting process. Um, our general manager, who's also our co-president, and then our technical director, who's kind of like a director of football, um, they are 100% involved in our scouting process and we present all of our information to them all the time. And then there's our owners. We do connect with them every now and then. I haven't had too much experience with that. Um, typically, they're more involved in that scouting process and the general manager will take like a final decision and propose it to them. Um, the primary stakeholders though are typically the coaching staff, general manager, and technical director. So I'm going to go over a little bit on the scouting side and a little bit on that coaching side where we talk about like a pregame analysis. So our scouting process, this is a bit of an overview of the way that we do things. Um, the first step that we have is to establish the needs that we have for a given player. So if Pedro was our center back and we think that we might be losing Pedro this coming summer, we need to decide, okay, what type of center back do we need to fulfill his position when he does leave? So we're looking at, are we planning for the future where we can get a younger player and kind of work them into the team? Are we looking for an older, more experienced player that can come straight in and make an impact? Uh, we're looking for things such as style of play, uh, what their skill level is, how much we can afford to pay them and the club that he may be coming from, uh, physical attributes, if they're you know, a big and strong player, if they're fast, anything like that. We try to get as specific as possible so that we know exactly what we want for the coaches, for the club, and kind of for like our long-term vision. And so once we have that established, then we kind of get into our scouting cycle. So the first thing might be filtering on the player pool. So we have you know, 20, 30, 40,000 professional soccer players in the world. Um, we want to narrow that down as small as possible so that we can kind of target our selections. Uh, then the next thing would be for us to identify the talent. And so here we get players from a ton of different sources. So we have agents and clubs who are sending us players all the time. We have ground scouts in other countries. They're identifying players through youth tournaments and watching other games. Just over years, they have their own little database of players that they're looking at. Then we have video scouts at the club right now. They are kind of doing the same thing just by watching games. And then on the data side, we're filtering through all these players that kind of meet that checklist of needs. And we're trying to find the best players that might fit this criteria to replace a center back. So once we kind of have all these different sources of talent and we have our own lists of players, we go ahead and rank these targets. And we do this by kind of checking each other's work. So if me and our other data analysts, we have a list of five or 10 center backs we think may be a good fit, We'll pass that along to our video scouts or our ground scouts, and they'll take a look at that. They'll provide their feedback. They'll put that kind of information into a report. And the same thing happens with those players that they provide. So we'll go ahead and take a look at them on the data side, provide a physical, quantitative, qualitative report, um, and make sure that there's two to three eyes on everyone. And we kind of come together and rank all of these players and say, okay, from these 50 players that were proposed by all these different sources, 
who's our number one, number two, number three targets. After that, that's when we pass it along to our stakeholders, our coaching staff, the general manager, technical director. We'll say, hey, can you guys have a look at these top three targets? This is who we think would be the best replacements for our center back. Let us know what you think. After that, they go ahead and give us feedback. If they like the player, then they kind of move forward with, you know, pursuing them, trying to figure out what the price might be, talking with the agent, talking with the club, um, you know, seeing what their level of interest is. If they aren't a fan, they'll go ahead and provide feedback, saying why they don't like them, why they think may, they may not be a good fit. And then that kind of restarts the cycle. Now, in the middle of all this, I have that player database symbol. Um, this kind of came from the top down, and it's actually been one of my more important roles over the last year. And it's that we kind of standardized our process to keep all of our reports, all of the input from the different scouts, from data, from um, the stakeholders, anything everyone has said about players, it gets stored in this database. So for future reference, we can look back at past players and kind of learn from it. And then also so that we always have these list of players. So at any given time, we kind of know who the replacements would be for a player. So that established needs is kind of existing outside of the cycle because technically, if we were going to lose Pedro, the center back, we should already have established the needs of who his top five replacements are. Um, and that was something that our general manager and our coaching staff wanted so that at any given time, they are always aware of who potential replacements might be. And they know they can go to the same spot in our database every time, find these reports, see what everyone's feedback is, see what other coaches and the other uh, technical director have already said about them. Um, and it kind of helps everyone stay on the same page and get like the bigger picture of what's going on. So on the other side of things, um, with like talking with coaches, working on pre-game analysis, anything like that, your communication is incredibly essential. Uh, you really need to have the soccer background for the staff to understand you and for you to be able to understand them. So everyone kind of has their own soccer language. Um, initially, we were going to kind of do like a translation thing where, oh, this is what a coach might say, and this is how that translates into the data world. But in reality, it's your mileage is going to vary based on your situation and you know your personality, the coach's personality, whoever you're working with. Um, so the most important thing is really just to ask questions. Uh, everyone speaks in their own way, and it's really just figuring out what they mean and that you truly understand what their definitions are for certain things. Um, and then once you're able to figure out what they mean, you convert that into your work and you, know, you do some data analysis on an upcoming opponent. You want to make sure that you present that back to them in their language and you kind of teach them about what it is you're providing. So if you're giving them a breakdown of an upcoming opponent on how they attack, you don't want to give them straight numbers every time, unless that is what they like. You kind of want to make sure you're giving it back to them in that soccer, soccer language and you truly understand what it is that they want. Um, so a quick little example of this. Um, this was something that came up when I first started at the job. Uh, someone from the coaching staff had asked, what should we look for in offensive transition against our next opponent? Now, for anyone who is familiar with soccer, a counterattack is something we can pretty easily identify if you're watching a game. Um, everyone kind of has a similar idea of what a counterattack might look like. But if you were asking someone to program that, we all may come up with different definitions. So you really would need to ask the coaching staff the first thing, well, what does offensive transition mean to you? And that question may seem simple, but when they start kind of giving you their description of it, you need to ask more and more questions to figure out how you can code that because you may not have the data to represent exactly what they say. So an example might be an offensive transition is when we win the ball back and the other team has not set up their defensive shape yet. Well, now you need to define what defensive shape is. You need to define exactly how long it takes for them to like set up that defensive shape. Is it just one moment? Is it for several seconds? Anything like that. So it's just making sure that you guys kind of both get on the same page. And then the next thing would be, you know, when they say, what should we look for? It's, is this an open-ended question where they kind of want any solutions possible? Or is it something where it's more specific? They want to know 
which players we can exploit, which spaces, which moments of the game. Um, and it's really just figuring out exactly what they want so that when you figure out how you can tackle this problem with data, you can kind of give them the exact product that they would be looking for that would help them the most. Um, coaches have three to four days before a game to work with players. So making sure that what you're giving them is really targeted and exactly what they're looking for is um, super essential. Um, and then the other thing too is all these definitions, they're meaningless if we don't have the data to work with them. So if you don't have tracking data and you only have event data where it's just a spotlight on the ball, some of these things might be meaningless and you might have to kind of work with them back and forth and say, I can't provide you with that, but maybe we can do something else that will help bridge the gap. And again, that's where having the soccer knowledge and data knowledge combined really helps um, bridge that gap and like get your message across. And so the last thing is um, it's really important when you're working with your coaching staff, your general manager, even with owners, is the consistency and timeliness of your work. So when I say consistent work, uh, what I mean is that you're kind of giving them the same product every time. Um, of course, things will develop over time. They will get better. They'll change as you get feedback. But if you can keep as many of those things the same, um, it really helps with buy-in because it's less things for them to learn. The, the coaches, the general manager, director of football, they all have the ton on their plate. And if they know exactly what they're going to get from you every time, and that could be for the appearance. So that's like the tables, plots, the format of videos you send them, anything like that. Um, the format, if they know they're always going to get a PowerPoint or they can always get this Google sheet. And then the same thing with like emails. If they know the day after a game, you're always going to send an email with a post-match report, or it's going to be a web app, or it's going to be in a Google drive or hard copy, anything like that. The consistency is really important. And something that I've been working on over the last few months has just been automating all of our process, which really ties back into that automation really makes your job easier, but also it is super important for the consistent aspect of everything. Uh, when you automate your work, everything's kind of standardized and it's really streamlines that process so that they know that you're always going to give them the same thing. Um, and then a huge piece of advice that I was given that I kind of love to talk about is giving yourself the opportunity to complete on the spot ad hoc tasks quickly. Um, and then that's again with like automation. A lot of times coaches or scouts will ask you for something on the spot that you may not have built out yet. Uh, as everyone knows with programming, you, know, you have to build out your tools and you have to spend time making these scripts. And sometimes they want something in the next hour or two that you, know, you may not be prepared to have. So if you can build yourself an app that allows you to visualize events in the game really quickly or anything that you, know, you think the coaching staff may be requesting often, um, that's a super important task to have. Uh, when you can get things to the staff quickly, again, it helps buy in. And that's what is really important to the stakeholders. Um, you can caveat the work when it may not be of perfect quality, but when you know you can give it to them in that timeline that matters, because like I said, there's only a few days before each game, um, then they know that they can kind of rely on you and you can always provide value to them. And yep, so that's all that I have. Um, if anyone has any questions right now, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can just roll straight into Dave's and talk about anything afterwards. Um, yeah, I think we're going to wait until the end for the uh, questions, Darian. Thank you, Darian. <clears throat> So Darian has a very specific set of stakeholders. I have some of the same, uh, but not all. And if you forgot where that feedback came from, let me know. Uh, so we're going to do a case study on someone who may want to sign a free agent player. I'm going to use hockey because the majority of our data is currently in hockey. Uh, I'll give you some parallels to soccer along the way. Feel free to stop as you wish. So the first thing we want to know, and I'm going to tell you which stakeholders we're looking at each time, who is this guy? Who are we looking to sign? So this might be a GM, or it might be an agent who wants to know who they're representing. They know the individual, but they don't necessarily know who they are as a player. They probably have 30 to 40 players of their own, possibly more. Uh, 
they need to know the identity of this person on the ice or on the pitch if we're best still back in soccer. So we look at games played this season. Here we have a legend, but visuals are a quick way to get things across to stakeholders. And because this is going to GMs and agents who may not be quite as well-versed in complex stats, we give them simple things to work with. So are they scoring? Are they generating points? Are they generating points with a man advantage? Are they winning face-offs? Simple game events they could see. And then how do they rank compared to others of that position in those events? Likewise, you want to generate it a little bit more than that. That isn't enough. There's a lot of skills in hockey and soccer and other flow sports that don't necessarily end in a goal or an assist. So we break these things down into archetypes or classes of players. So there's offensive forwards, there's, right, we have defensive forwards, we have power forwards, people who are on the puck and in front of the net and general past the goalie for most of the match. Um, this particular player happens to be about average, a little better as an offensive forward. There are certain things to do very well, and there's certain things to do eh, okay to better than average. So if we look here, and be pushing the right button, um, quite good at face-offs, very good on the penalty kill, despite being a relatively mediocre defensive forward. That means they're good in a very important situation in the game if you don't know hockey. Um, but it doesn't come up all the time, so you put them on in certain bits. Otherwise, good passer, good skater, okay scorer. Uh, and then you look at similar players that we come up with over on the side here. So these are who we might look at as contract targets if we're an agent or contract comps if we're a GM. And we can get some more like list of strengths and weaknesses. So these are the things they're best at. This would probably go to a scout, right? Where the things they're best at in the game and where they're where they weakest. So again, offensive rebound, loose puck recoveries. So they're good at picking up rebounds, despite not being someone that hangs out in front of the net. So notice, does back arrow work in this? We're just gonna be going, yeah, sure does. Notice Agent GM got really broad stroke categories to start with. These are box score stats. And now they're getting box score stats and some very clear skills. Oh, you're good at passing. Oh, okay, they're good defensively in this part of the ice. And the scout got really technical in-game things. There's a reason for this. You want to be able to explain what you're presenting to your stakeholders quickly, right? Um, I don't know my audience here. How many of you know what an expected goal is from soccer or anything else? Great. So you can explain those quickly, right? Coach, GM, media, it doesn't matter. You can spit that out and they get it. Can you explain your XG model quickly? Probably not. So we choose not to do that, right? Same idea here. So something else that's got my look at, here's a beast one block four seasons. Um, again, we're looking at human strength offensive generating plays is a list of about 15 things. The scout may know what all of them are. The list is available. It's actually available on hover over if I didn't screenshot our website and actually pulled it up, but I'm not handing this to the GM. Another version of report cards. You saw the line lines before same thing, but another version, uh, Oops, player's name is at the top, that's fine. This player is a free agent this coming season. You can see that they're particularly good at overall. They're falling quite nicely. Everything is color coded here. So if I want a quick glance of are they good in this category or not, it's there. There's also a number, there's also the bar chart. Summarize data nicely, regardless of stakeholder. And then we'll go into a little bit deeper dive for things with the coaching staff. So we have in a shooting shooter talent model. If I'm going to use this player, how should I use this player? Where are they going to be good? Well, this player is particularly good in the inner slot, the little home-shaped plate area right in front of the net. A lot of people are pretty good there, but this one is quite a bit better than average. Worse than you would expect from the outer slot right there. 
uh, particularly for someone who's good here, and better than average shooting from the outside. So despite being a center, shoots fairly well from the wings. I would, might discourage this player from shooting from the outside if I put them on the ice, but these are things we give the coaching staff to deal with. So who are we getting? Is this who we actually want? What parts of the net do they aim at? What parts of pre-shot action? So seam passes in hockey are the equivalent of crosses in soccer. So east, west, or west, east. This player is actually finishes worse off of crosses than off of stationary shots from different places. But off of what the hockey equivalent of a drop pass is, if they're on the west side of the ice, scores quite wisely. And because they're a forward, they're going to be expected to take face-offs, whether we put them in center, where they take a lot of face-offs, or we put them on the wing, where they take some face-offs. So if we're doing these in soccer, you might have quarters, free kicks, and then the same scoring plots. Uh, but this player, this is the direction they win most of their face-offs. So you set up plays with them on the ice to win. He tends to win towards the boards, unless he's in his defensive zone. So you set up plays with this, if this player's taking the draw, you know the puck's coming towards the boards, you set up your play accordingly. And this is the same thing, but for power play. So on the power play, more importantly, set up fixed plays. So it's, a, it's effectively a set piece, the power play face off. So they draw one of two ways, you set your plays accordingly. So these are things we might give to the coaching staff. Again, the GM doesn't care. Thank you, sir. Nor does a scout. A scout. Finally, what are we going to pay this player? Right. So we just talked about who this player is. We decide, hey, we want to sign them. What should we pay them? Well, here are the team-friendly contracts for player comps. All right. We have guys who are all. Here's our player's most recent contract showing up, but it's from a few years ago. Uh, we have Nick Suzuki, signed as a restricted for street agent for average annual value of just under $8 million a year. Did the same thing out of Kuznetsov. Dupont Cat signed for a bit less. Somebody got a dis discount there. And then if I'm the team, I want to sign him to a Casey Middlestat contract for $2.5 million a year instead of eight. Now that I'm going to have the option. So the GM is going to get this list. GM's also going to get this list because this is who the agent wants you to think he is, right? Here's our current contracts for all these guys. Frost, David Krejci. He's not David Krejci, but he shows up enough like him. Luke Shen, Braden Shen. Like these are big numbers. And then the agent's target contract is going to be J.K. Miller who is a very similar player and just signed a seven year, $8 million a year contract. There's quite a bit of give between two and a half and 8 million a year. Uh, this is a player who had one really good offensive season, kind of tanked a bit and is playing nicely right now. So there's an argument to be made for where this falls. But this is where the negotiation comes in more than anything else, but this is what the agent gets. Now, if it's a smart agent, they'll ask for, what do you have for comp semi player? And we'll give them both lists. But stakeholders do tend to get what they ask for. You have to know what they want. At this point, I think I'm gonna hand over to questions for either of us. And, oh, sorry, market. We also have a salary cap model uh, that generates the market GM, so Eight-year contracts are kind of an aberration. We're going to pretend that doesn't exist. But in the seven-year average annual value for this, we're predicting about 5.1, which, if you notice, is nicely between the 2.5 of the GM target and the 8 of the agent target. Uh, the model is better than just averaging this out. Um, it's also last year's model, so it should improve later. Questions for myself or Darian? <laughs> 